Hello again, I am Blunty, and one of the seemingly identical graphics cards is slightly different to the other one. Of course, you presumably read the title of this video before you clicked on it, so you already know one of them is the GTX 1050 and the other one is the GTX 1050 Ti. And what makes one different from the other is subtle but significant. The TI version has more CUDA cores active, 768 versus 640. It has just eight more texture units, 48 versus 40. It has twice the video memory, four gigabytes versus two gigabytes of GDDR5. But most of the other things like memory bandwidth, transistor counts, output connectors, power draw, and thermals are all identical. The two cards I have here are from Gigabyte, one of my personal favorite brands. Gigabyte split their offerings into four main categories. The OC cards, their base level, the Windforce OC cards, the G1 gaming cards, and above that, but only on some lines, and not the GTX 1050s by the way, the Extreme branding. But the ones I've got here for some nice middle ground representative apples to apples comparisons to peel out the real world differences between the GTX 1050 and GTX 1050 Ti are the mid-range Windforce OC branded cards. In Aussie dollar terms, at the time I'm making this video at least, the price difference is $40, which on the one hand is quote unquote just $40, but in the context of the starting price of the GTX 1050 of 199 Aussie dollars is a 20% price increase to move up to the Ti flavor. And if you're going to spend 20% more, you really do need to know if it's worth spending 20% more. So let's find out. And because we're dealing with otherwise identical Gigabyte Windforce OC cards, this should be quite revealing indeed. First off, by the way, I just want to say, hot damn, I love Gigabyte's coolers. They're insanely quiet. So quiet, in fact, that during my testing, I had to actually turn around and look at the card to find out if the fans had even spun up yet from the 0 dB fan stop mode, even when under ass kicking benchmark loads. They are very literally whisper quiet, possibly even quiet. But anyway, on the matter of benchmarks, well, in the DX12 based Time Spy test, you may be as tickled as I was to find out the performance difference here is 25%, greater in fact than the difference in the price. Pay 20% more, get 25% more performance. Pretty satisfying so far, right? Well, the DX11 based Firestrike benchmark hands in a difference of 10%. Sure, less satisfying numerically, but still a significant boost. And moving forward, more and more new games will of course be using the DX12 and similarly more modern APIs anyway. And of course, canned benchmarks are canned benchmarks. And while they're useful to a point, they don't always directly apply to the real world experience of actually gaming. So, Doom, using the Vulkan engine and shoved into Ultra settings, but not nightmare options, of course, as neither the 1050 or 1050 Ti have enough video memory for the nightmare settings. The difference here is actually very, very significant. At times, the Ti even doubles the frame rates that its little brother can manage. But both cards actually manage Doom surprisingly well. Very playable under Ultra for both cards. Though with the 1050, personally, I'd move it to a slightly lower graphics setting to get the higher frame rates that Doom's non-stop action gameplay really does benefit from so much. Moving back to DX12 now though, this time in a real game, Rise of the Tomb Raider, in higher settings. The benchmark results of 50 FPS overall versus 62 FPS overall once again exceed that 20% price differential with a 25% performance boost. This time though, it's rather more necessary to drop the GTX 1050's graphics settings down in order to get a smooth, playable experience, as in high settings, you're seeing dives below 30 FPS on the little card. Meanwhile, the TI version keeps things much more satisfyingly around the 40 FPS or more mark, very occasionally dipping into the high 30s. In Mafia 3's medium settings, there's a much more subtle difference often only 5 FPS or so making the difference, both cards teetering on the edge of absolute minimum playable frame rates. 
Now, Mafia 3 has already proven itself as a rather aggressive game when it comes to swallowing up system power, but even still, I'd honestly expected both these cars to choke solid on medium settings here, so all in all, I'm reasonably impressed. Though, of course, for my own tastes, I drop a few settings down a bit more to give me an even smoother frame rate. Pray that pops and outlives the both of us. But if he doesn't, every motherfucker in the hollow is going to be looking to us, a gun, and for us. Just saying we gotta be ready when that day comes. Yeah, well that's not something we gotta worry about right now. So just cool it with your grand plans, all right? Yeah, all right. Forza Horizon 3 is a rather interesting creature for these benchmarks. It's the only game I had tested that immediately and aggressively insisted that the GTX 1050's mere 2GB of memory is an issue that it is ill-equipped to cope with, protesting that even the medium settings would starve to death. And, you know what, so it was. Because while there seems to be plenty of actual horsepower for the level of detail and effects bought by the medium settings, there was a catastrophic amount of stutter introduced as the game immediately flooded the video memory. Dropping down to the low settings remedied this issue, now delivering a very smooth and entirely pleasant experience above 60 FPS on the GTX 1050 and reaching out for triple digit frame rates on the GTX 1050 Ti. Now, obviously, given these results, I then had to push the GTX 1050 Ti back into the previously protested medium settings, and sure enough, zero issues here with a card with 4GB of video memory. And in fact, only a comparatively moderate drop in maximum frame rates, with gameplay still well above 60fps and into the pleasantly playable 70s and 80s. Pretty ideal for this game. And finally, Watch Dogs 2, a game pretty unkind to CPU resources as I found out recently, but when it comes to even the little GTX 1050, it copes amazingly well. In fact, I managed a very playable experience well above 30 FPS, hovering either side of 40 FPS. Meanwhile, the GTX 1050 Ti pops in with the expected performance delta, and as we come full circle doing the math, it is indeed around 25% difference. So, the takeaway story seems to be that while the difference in AAA gaming isn't always so, much of the time you really are getting precisely what you're paying for with the upgrade to the TI flavor of the GTX 1050. If you are indeed a gamer, I can see no real justification for not spending the extra 40 Aussie dollary dues here. You really do get what you pay for. So then comes the question, why even consider the slightly more budget-friendly option at all? Well, the Gigabyte Windforce OC GTX 1050 still has a place in things like media center PCs. It is ninja silent, stunningly cool, and will of course monster all your media needs, including naturally the 4K stuff. The GTX 1050 is also still a very sensible choice for people who are more into the eSports type games. CSGO, League of Legends, Dota 2, all that kind of stuff that's relatively easy on a system, and any number of more casual, less hardcore AAA gaming experiences. With the bonus ability to actually reach out into those AAA games, so long as you're okay with low or medium settings. Meanwhile, the GTX 1050 Ti is a fantastic choice if you're on a controlled budget but want to know you can reach high settings in many AAA games at nice frame rates. You can hopefully now make the right call for your needs and your budget. Hopefully this has been interesting, informative or entertaining. Preferably all three. I am Blunty and I will catch you next time.